Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to today's event on creation of duties. I'm Jason Gumpert from dynamicsworld.com, and uh, thanks for joining. Uh, we are joined today by Kevin McCreary, uh, Associate Director at Protivity, and Andy Smith, President at FastPath, for this session. Uh, as we get started, please know that uh, Andy and Kevin do plan on uh, trying to make this uh, an interesting session. They will be taking questions at the end, and we'll also have a poll question for you in just a few minutes, so do look out for that. Uh, a couple of other, if you do want to ask questions, you can ask them at any time during the session. Uh, just use the Q&A block that you should see uh, off to the right of the main uh, presentation window. And uh, one other thing to note, if you have uh, a need to set up a, a separate call uh, with, uh, with our presenters or uh, can't stay for the whole session today and want to get caught up later, just fill out that, um, the form that you'll see in the media viewer section. Uh, if you if you would like to request that uh, again at any point uh, today, uh, so without further delay, uh, we're going to get things started. I'm going to hand it off to uh, Kevin McCreary to start us off. Kevin, thanks. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. We appreciate you joining us um, as we discuss segregation of duties and, and how it's impacting organizations more and more. Um, just to introduce myself. Um, as you said, my name is Kevin McCrary. I'm Associate Director with Proactivity in our Atlanta office. Um, I spent the majority of my career really helping my clients uh, make better use of their major and enterprise applications while applying the most effective and efficient controls to support proper transaction processing as well as uh, meeting their external and internal compliance requirements. Um, Andy, did you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, good morning or afternoon to everyone, depending on where you're at. Uh, my name is Andy Snook. I work in the Development Center at FastPath in lovely Des Moines, Iowa. Um, FastPath, we have a software platform uh, that helps support our customer, customers and our partners like Proactivity uh, make analyzing segregation of duties easier uh, and making that entire ongoing process uh, more achievable and a repeatable process. So uh, we're going to take a look at a lot of different strategies that we've seen over the last 12 years of helping companies with this, some of the mistakes to avoid and some of the strategies that you can implement uh, to make a life a little bit easier uh, as you're going through. So Kevin, super uh, excited to present with you again today. It's been a while since we've been on the same call, so I'll uh, turn it back over to you and uh, let you go, man. All right. Well, I appreciate it, Andy. Um, so why are we talking about segregation of duties? You know, this isn't something that uh, we haven't heard about before. It's not groundbreaking. Um, but one of the most common struggles that I've seen in striking in, in organizations is striking the appropriate balance of restricting access to prevent misbehavior versus not getting in the way of standard operating procedure. Um, segregation of duty controls are balanced, and they have to be aligned with policy, corporate risk tolerance, and efficient operations. And we said there's nothing really new or particularly sophisticated about the concept of segregation of duties. I think everyone's familiar with you know, working in a concession stand for a fundraiser. Um, you know, maybe it was probably very rare that you were given the responsibility to sell concessions, count receipts, deposit the money, and reconcile any bank reports. Um, which you think about it, it's a fundraiser. You're donating your time. Why, why would you be there to commit fraud against a charity? Um, however, you know, when you give someone the opportunity, um, or if you eliminate that opportunity, uh, there's really no worry about someone self-justifying any acts. Um, companies have generally been good about protecting themselves to at least some level, but, but times are changing. So companies are asking their employees to do a lot more with a lot less headcount. Um, regulators are becoming more educated, which results in additional levels of concern. We've got external auditors um, are increasingly requiring companies to have intentional, formal SOD frameworks so that they can prove that the SOD frameworks are working and that there's been some risk established risk uh, framework for the organization. And with the automation and the ability to conduct and perform more detailed, accurate analysis, auditors are beginning to have greater insight into these areas 
and as a result, they're demanding resolutions from the organizations. Um, you know, given all this new scrutiny um, and, you know, the amount of available information, keeping on top of segregation duties has become a significant challenge for a lot of organizations. So let's talk about access in the news and, and what we've seen from a segregation duties perspective. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the PCAOB, it stands for the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. They are the regulatory body, body that audits the auditors. Um, I don't know if the PCAOB has auditors, but it would be interesting to see how deep that, uh, that audit rabbit hole goes. Uh, the PCAOB is responsible for assessing the quality of the audits performed by the external auditors and assess if the external auditor sufficiently performed their assessment procedures, retained their independence, and made proper conclusions based on the facts. This inspection not only includes the sufficiency of the plan tests, but also the comprehensiveness to ensure that all tests that should have been performed were considered and conducted using the appropriate level of judgment. Um, in this example, in 2013, the PTOB inspection uh, became really a, an event uh, in the area of IT controls that really cascaded a lot of uh, things that people are seeing today. Um, it's kind of ironic that it was a small oil and gas company that got selected, um, which this company has since been uh, purchased and absorbed. But the progression of the events you'll see are, are kind of as follows. First, uh, the PCAOB cited problems in both management and external audits testing of IT change management and logical access, among other areas. They specifically cited excessive access, uh, including the widespread use of copying peers' access instead of using a role-based concept for user administration. You know, most people would be familiar with that as far as make, make my access just like John's. Um, you know, I'm sure we've all seen that concept before where uh, the request is to, you know, create identical access as to another individual that may have recently left or is performing similar functions. Um, as a common response to the SOB issues, the company um, originally talked these issues away with some general mitigating controls and identified standard mitigating controls for, um, you know, the risks that were posed. Um, but because the PCAOB is taking this new hard line, they determined that the mitigating controls were not over, were too broad, were not consistently applied, and they were impossible to prove that the controls were effective. Um, this ultimately resulted in the company pulling its assertion on their internal controls over financial reporting. Um, now, they didn't have to actually complete a restatement uh, but they had to go through a number of exhausting, rigorous procedures to prove that the issue didn't allow for errors or manipulation that, that wasn't detected based on their, their previous uh, reporting. Um, after all the substantive procedures, uh, for three years worth of financial statements, uh, Forrest was able to refile their 2013 opinion, but with three material weaknesses and seven significant deficiencies. Now, I want to make sure that we understand one thing. Um, although it could be definitely argued that force had not taken their controls seriously enough, especially with its fairly lax access controls, if they were just going on the precedent that had been, uh, or the standard that had been set previously, um, their attitude on the procedures of their external auditor would have been reasonably on par for most of the organizations. Um, but because of the change, this amounted to uh, a significant change in the tone of the PCOB and resulted in the expanded audit procedures, uh, not only for Forrest as they went through the potential restatement, but also you know, to a number of organizations that are now feeling that effect. So what are the impacts that happened because of the three material weaknesses that had to be filed and the seven significant deficiencies? So first, a potential merger was held up. 
Um, as, as mentioned, force has been acquired, but the deal was very much in jeopardy due to all this uncertainty. And I'm sure raised the total cost of acquisition, I mean, pretty significantly. Regardless, you know, the effort and money spent by all parties was pretty staggering. And additionally, we did some analysis around the, the stock, price, stock price of the of forest during the, the next three to five days. And we noticed that it was reduced by approximately 10%. Um, and was this because of the material weakness announcement or because the street thought that the merger wouldn't go through? I don't know what the exact direct cause was, but you can tell that a lot of shareholder value was lost uh, because of the material weaknesses that were communicated. Um, you know, we, we serve clients, as Protivity serve clients across all of the major accounting firms, and it was uncanny to see how quickly we began to see you know, a different tone from not just force external auditor, but all of them. Um, you know, the external auditors read everyone's, uh, at least, you know, the big four read everyone's uh, PCAOB reports, and they try to get ahead of the trends that they're seeing at the other organizations based on the reports that the PTOB is, is distributing. Um, so, you know, the, the reason that, that Forest is such a significant uh, event was because it really caused a lot of your external auditors to focus more on segregation of duties. Um, even though what was acceptable in the past, uh, just a few months ago, uh, at least at that time, was appropriate, and now it's cascaded into a much bigger uh, focus for your external auditor and the PCOB. So um, we've got a uh, we've got a um, slide where we wanted to poll everyone. Uh, if we could go ahead and, and start that polling question. One of the things that we wanted to know was. Can, can everyone see the polling question? The polling question should be up now for uh, folks in the audience, and I do see uh, at least a, a couple people starting to uh, take it. So, uh, yeah, that is so open now. One of the things that we've noticed is there are a number of common frustrations that people have around segregation and duties. And we'd love to know what you're experiencing, and we'll share those results once uh, we give you a few more seconds to answer the question. We'll give a 10 second here, then we'll close it out. All right. All right, it will be a few more seconds before we can show the results, but I can tell you it's, um, Bubble proving controls are working is, is by far number one. The others are fairly even. All right. Well, I mean, one of the things that we're finding is that a number of organizations are finding multiple frustrations across segregation of duties. And what it looks like here is we've got, uh, and Jason, are you able to share the results? Uh, I am, and the audience should be seeing those now. So we'll but I can, I can just, if you're not seeing them, uh, I can tell you the trouble yeah. proving controls are working. Okay. Yeah, and then um, SOD violations year after year is 21%, something that we're seeing a lot of um, you know, mitigating controls or window dressing. But you'll see that, that really trouble proving controls are working, and, you know, the, the repeat of the SOD violations are the ones that are coming up the most. Uh, these are definitely concerns that we've seen from organizations year over year. You know, as mentioned before, SOD in one form or another has been something most public companies have to, had to address in some capacity ever since the control requirements of Sarbanes-Oxley, if, if not before then. And given the complexities of organizations, their enterprise systems, um, it has often been proven to be an elusive target to really hit segregation duties, duties squarely um, even without the recently added pressure. Um, and some of these are the common frustrations that, that everyone is seeing as, as they go through the audit year over year. Um, 
So one of the things that we want to do is talk through a few of uh, some real situations that we've seen in the past and how things have been addressed by organizations and how they have managed uh, some of their segregation of duties issues um, within the situations that they were currently in. So the first case study we're going to see is related to a uh, public company or a consumer products manufacturing organization that had recently gone public. Um, they were doing about $2 billion in revenue, um, and they were going through a, an AX2012 global implementation. Um, as stated, this organization had recently been spun off as a public entity. Um, as part of their transformation to a new organization, they began a project to implement AX2012. Um, however, they were just pilot, piloting a location in the U.S. Um, they were in constant contact throughout the project with an external auditor about what needed to be performed to ensure that the project was a success, success from a compliance perspective and that security and segregation of duties um, was, in, was on the external auditor's list of requirements. Um, as the project progressed, you know, security and SOD remained a high-risk item for them, um, and it was constantly reported to executive leadership and the project sponsors. And the management team around the security work stream you know, wanted to provide leadership uh, some uh, information that security was going to get addressed and they wanted to get it off the project radar. Um, and basically, management told us, the last thing we want is security being the item that holds us back from going live. And you know, this was something that was a high-risk item throughout the project, and that was the one thing that they wanted to ensure did not stop them from going live. Now, what was the project and what, what was the approach that we took? So the, the project originally started off with management coming to Protivity and asking if we could perform an assessment. Um, they just wanted to be able to provide uh, their management team as well as the external auditors some information that segregation of duties was being addressed, that security was being designed appropriately, and that they were in a position to uh, be successful when they ultimately went live. Um, so our original scope was to perform that SOD assessment. You know, if you look at the, the project scope and approach here, you know, the first thing that we did was develop a rule set that was customized to them. So what are the key risks to the organization? Um, extract all of the data around security to understand um, you know, and conduct our analysis. And after we started digging into the data and actually analyzing some of the, the data that we received, um, we noted that there are a number of issues with their current design, uh, including you know, not all security was in the assessed environment. So they had multiple environments with different security builds um, and, and roles and, and permissions in those, uh, those different builds. Um, Security was being built and not compiled and rolled out to other test environments. So um, while there was security being built in multiple environments, it wasn't then being compiled and rolled out to the other environments. The custom objects that had been built uh, did not have any security that was actually built for them. Um, and there was no process for gathering user functional requirements for security, no change control processes for making changes. Um, I mean, all in all, we noted that they just weren't prepared from a security perspective. So we went to management, communicated what was happening, and pivoted to support them with security design as part of their implementation. You know, after, after identifying these issues, management wanted us to help implement a plan and processes to allow for their team to take ownership. Um, but they didn't really know where to start and weren't completely sure how to get there. Now, we helped them you know, update their SOD tool to support assessing uh, their roles and users. Um, we then gathered requirements from all the users to understand exactly what the, um, the user required in order to perform their, their standard job functions. 
we help design processes for them to build and test roles, and then ultimately user mapping, which is the mapping of roles to users. Um, we worked with the project team to build the roles and, and ultimately help them uh, design and test the roles that were going to be used for uh, user acceptance testing, as well as ultimately rolled out as part of the implementation. What did, what did we result in? All custom capabilities that they were developing ultimately had security created and designed. Um, any custom capabilities that were designed were included in the rule set as necessary. They had a tool that was going to help them evaluate roles and users prior to assignment. Um, all high-risk controls, we identified mitigating controls to support uh, those high-risk controls that required um, the conflict based on the business process. And then ultimately, security was no longer an at-risk process for the implementation. Um, and this is this was critical for management because um, they did they, as I stated they were it, it was extremely important that security did not stop them from going live and cause them to spend a whole lot more money to continue the the implementation project. Um, additionally, we also helped management with a roadmap to ensure that they were placing sufficient focus on designing and implementing governance processes around what we had just built. So we wanted to make sure they had change control processes around their roles, appropriate user administration processes, and appropriate uh, user access review processes. I'll move on to the second case study. Um, just to give you an overview of this project, it was a Fortune 500 uh, company, power tool manufacturer. They had uh, multiple ERP, production environments. Um, they had reported a significant deficiency due to a large number of SOD issues. They currently had a tool in place that they were performing SOD analysis with, um, but when reporting to internal and external audit, uh, both, both internal and external audit decided that because of the numerous violations, uh, that it needed to be raised to the level of a significant deficiency and ultimately reported to the audit committee. The audit committee wanted to ensure that there weren't any future issues and better understand the impact of the issue. Um, and, and so it was determined that a quantification project to understand the specifics of the issues could be performed to determine where the focus of their investigation should begin. Now, I talk about quantification, but what is SOD quantification? So your risk, here's a standard example. The user could create a, a ghost vendor or change an existing vendor account and direct an existing invoice for payment or misappropriate the payment of those funds. This concept of quantification isn't really new, but the application of it in a more consistent and risk-based approach has only recently been more widely adopted. So we'll talk about the first layer of SOD, and that's our user population. So when we have an SOD tool, everyone's familiar with being able to see exactly how many individuals have the ability, and using our example, have the ability to perform uh, vendor maintenance and issue vendor payments. Now, the next layer below that, just because the person has the ability, doesn't mean that they actually did any of those transactions. So understand, you know, were those transactions executed? Did the individuals who have the ability also execute the transactions for vendor maintenance and issuing payments? Beyond that, the next layer, would be risk violations and data. Um, so were there actually any vendors and issued payments over $1,000? Um, it may have been performed by multiple individuals, but let's risk rank um, you know, our, our thresholds and understand if these were actually performed. And then finally, through quantification, 
you'll see that we're able to assess actual violations where the same individual maintained a vendor and issued a payment over $1,000 to that same vendor. Now, this is what quantification is to get us to the ability to actually determine what the dollar value and the risk would have been for the organization. Our approach for helping the organization do this was let's scope and prioritize the key risks to the uh, organization. So um, validating our current SOD findings, the number of conflicts, uh, the users, et cetera, and then identify what SAP, what environments were actually uh, in scope and what company codes or um, organizational units, you know, and understand the warehouses that actually wanted to be assessed. Um, we extracted data from the organization to understand, you know, from a transactional perspective, who's performing uh, certain uh, transaction types. Um, the next step was really analyzing that data, mapping it to our SOD risks, and then finally, you know, present our deliverables um, and develop a remediation strategy for how we were going to uh, address each one of the the actual violations. Now, the results, as you can see here, um, we were able to have a 95% reduction of users. Um, and these results help distinguish between potential areas of risk, which would require additional follow-up, and then areas of, of little or no concern. You know, one of the things that, that we were doing is really trying to find a needle in the haystack, but we were able to significantly reduce our population that needed to be investigated. And it was a good thing that we did that because we actually found that one of them was perpetrating fraud. Um, you know, as a result, like I said, 95% reduction of users and a 92% reduction of the dollars that were actually at risk through this quantification effort. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that I mentioned earlier was that, well, this is not a new concept. It's usually triggered through some sort of deficiency evaluation where you know, the auditor has identified a, um, a risk or a violation because an individual has the capability to perform two uh, conflicting transactions or conflicting functions. And ultimately, we have to, as the business, look through to determine if there was any true risk. Um, this helped us actually be a little bit more targeted in a much larger population. Now, I'm going to pass it off to Andy, and he can tell us, how do we begin going through the process of really addressing segregation of duties and, and trying to build a framework out? Andy? Uh, thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. You can go ahead and flip to that next slide for me. And so, really, I think one of the, the, the biggest place to begin and, and one of the challenges we see most organizations uh, when they start uh, this process and segregation of duties analysis is an ongoing process is they treat it like a transaction, that it's something you just do once, whether it's when you're implementing uh, dynamics, whether you're, uh, the auditor just asks you to do it, you just do it once and, and leave it alone. And a lot of times what happens is that it gets placed on one person. It's the responsibility of one person. It's either the whoever's responsible for the audit. It could be the controller. Uh, it could be the, uh, someone in the IT department but it's just one person's responsibility to, to run that project. And the challenge that we see is um, that an ERP is kind of a unique thing because it crosses a lot of places. It's, it's an IT product, but it's also a financial product. And the challenge becomes if you, get, if you just silo it off into IT or finance or not talk to the audit team about it, you're not going to have really all the right people in the room. So where to start is to get all of that, that team in a room together. Um, so, like I said, the ERP sit in the middle of the, the IT team and the business process owners. Business process owners typically don't understand uh, the application security. 
this is where I could, you know, make the joke of uh, there are a lot of people that are responsible for security that don't really understand the underlying security, but it can get complicated um, in how those security objects work together, whether no matter what uh, what Dynamics product you're using. Um, and so to ask a purchasing manager or ask a controller to be an expert in dynamic security is a lot. So it, it can be a challenge. On the other side of that, the IT team, you're asking an IT person who is the expert in security, maybe they're a developer, to be an expert in purchasing and start to understand the impact of the risk of of uh, have someone having access, as Kevin's example, to vendors and being able to create purchase orders or, or, or process payments, you're not going to be able to quantify that risk. You, they don't understand the controls around that, so you really need to get those teams in the same room um, as well with somebody that really understands risk, right? What risks are we talking about? Um, so there are very few people at the organization that also have a holistic view of the entire end-to-end -end process. Um, so really what you want to get in that room are people that understand the systems that are involved, people that understand the business processes that are involved, the roles that are involved, uh, any integrations, and then what are we, if you're under some sort of uh, regulations, what are the standards for those regulations? It could be HIPAA, it could be uh, PCI compliance, it could be SOX, it could be, there are lots of different regulations. They've probably just passed three more regulations since we started this session. Um, so having somebody in there that really understands those rules. So an example of that was we started this process uh, with one of our customers and we were doing the order to cash process. And we had everybody in the room and we were walking step by step through the, and mapping the business process. So we had the development team, uh, we had the AR team, we had the controller, uh, everyone was in the same room. And as we went through, we got to the end and we started talking about cre credit card processing. And this was a long time ago because I'm getting pretty old. Um, but one of the junior developers had said, oh, well, we, we always push the, in the credit card information out into that access database. And everybody said, we do what? And they said, yeah, well, so people could reuse their credit cards again and again. I just save it out to this access database. And no one had any visibility. He thought he was being helpful, right? He thought it was a great idea to push this out. It's customer service. We're making users' lives easier. But he didn't think through it in terms of PCI compliance, that there's an access database that's sitting around with all of our customers' uh, credit card information and everything that you would need just sitting there in plain text. Right, he had the best of intentions, but didn't really understand the risk. Had we not all been in the same room, he had been developing in a vacuum, right, and didn't understand that that was a risk. He had never heard of PCI compliance. But until we walked through step by step that order to cash process, it really, we find that out and find that risk there. So it's critical to get the right people in the room in order for this to be a successful ongoing pro uh, process and not just a transactional project. Um, the other thing that helps if you get all these uh, team members in the same room is really going to be that you get a lot more buy-in when you start to do the reviews. Um, you get pushback from people saying, you know, this is just yet something else I have to do, and they're going to take it more seriously because they're going to start to understand the risks there. Um, so that's the first key thing is getting uh, the people into that room. So what's the first step? Once you get all the right people in the right room, and I think Kevin has, has made a great point of justifying why this is important at your organization to get the time from the team members, right? This segregation of duties analysis has a huge impact positively and negatively, um, so it should be easy to build a case internally as to why you need to uh, bring all these people together in meetings. So Kevin, if you can, oh, you already did, you're ahead of me, of course, as always. Um, so really, where are we going to start? There, there, there are really five phases or five steps into this. And the first one is the business definition, which is really your foundation for everything you're going to do going forward. It's going to help you create the scope. And then there's a technical definition where you start to understand your methodology, your SOD policies, your rules, the IT system, the systems that may be in scope. And then actually the basics, how are we going to do this process? Who are the people that are involved? What are the technologies we're going to use? How are we going to iterate through that process? Then the next thing you do is actually the testing, right? So you actually go out, whatever your methodology may be, you start performing the testing against that to find out where your risks are. And then these last two steps 
um, sometimes you'll see them back and forth. But there, it's remediation and mitigation. But I always like to put remediation, which is basically another way to say that is cleaning up your security. Right, so Kevin mentioned at the beginning that you have role-based security instead of a people-based security, right? That what you can do is say, hey, if we go out and clean up our AP clerk role, then it's going to be much easier when we assign that role going forward that we're going to minimize the risk that we have uh, in that role. Um, and then mitigation is really shoring up that there are going to be places, as Kevin said, it's a balance between preventative controls and productivity that there are going to be some places where you're going to have risk, uh, and what you need to do is put a control in place to mitigate, you know, somebody leaving the concession stand with the nacho money, right? So those are really the five things. So we'll walk through quickly here and start to talk about each one of those steps and how that's defined. So the first one, go ahead, Kev, uh, to the next one, the business definition. So this is really where you're building the scope, right? This is really... Um, where you're going to start to talk as an organization about, like as Kevin talked about with the quantification, what are the high-risk areas for you? And what you want to do is, you'll hear me say take a risk-based approach a lot. This is what allows you to take that risk-based approach, the scoping. And one of the things I'll mention is this also allows you to be proactive with your auditors instead of reactive to the auditors. So as an organization, you know your business better than the auditors do, hopefully. And so you can sit down and say, these are the processes that we've identified that are in scope for us. This is why we think these are high risk instead of some staff auditor that comes in and says, we're supposed to look at order to cash inside of Dynamics. It's, well, we don't even do order to cash inside of Dynamics. That's in a completely different system. As an organization, you still need to focus on that. But my point is, you don't want to let the auditor lead you down. You can say, this is what we think is high risk. This is why it's important and build that case as to why you're doing that. So the first one is to sit down as an organization and talk about the processes that will be in scope. Where are our highest risk processes? And then that's what we're going to focus on. Um, the next thing would be uh, to build business process maps. Um, and so if you, I think I have an example of one in there, Kevin, if you skip ahead a couple slides, um, I think it got buried in there. Um, yeah, so this is just a swim lane process map. You have the roles down the left-hand side. You have the systems there at the bottom. Um, essentially what you're doing is just walking through the business process. So this is what we were doing at our customer when we found out all the credit cards were going into some access database that no one had ever heard of. So if you can map these processes, you start to understand what those individuals are going to do. So, Kevin, if you flip back to my other slide there, sorry. I'm putting you to work today. Thanks, man. Um, so if you, you want to use those business process maps to unite the teams, so making sure that getting better visibility across IT, audit, the business process owners. Um, the other thing that you want to do is select a core set of SOD policies. So we get the question probably once a week that says, hey, is there a standard rule set out there for, uh, for Dynamics, insert the product name here? Um, and the challenge with that is every customer is going to have their own set of rules. We have one customer that has 11 rules in their SOD rule set. We have another customer that has over 600 rules in their rule set. So it depends on the customer. Uh, there is a standard set of policies um, out there that ISACA uh, has developed. Um, so you hear, you know, Kevin and I talk about the vendor purchase order, uh, maintaining general ledger master data, creating journal entries, but it has a lot of those out there. And at this level of the project, all you want to do is think about it at a business level. We're not talking about your underlying products yet. All we're talking about is from a bit, from a business process level, what are the risks that are important to us, right? So that ISACA list is done at that business process level. Um, as you're building your business processes and walking through those swim lanes, make sure that you document where the risks are, right? That if you can say, hey, we have one role here that has to create vendors and create purchase orders, well, what's, what's the risk here? You can document that, and then you can start to build the controls into those business processes as well. So if you're using workflow, uh, some other uh, functionality, maybe use positive pay with your bank, whatever it may be, you can start to add those to the business processes as well. 
So it's, like I said, make sure that you include the roles, the systems, the risks, and the controls in those business process maps, and it's going to help tremendously in terms of when you build your security for Dynamics, uh, when you go through auditors uh, would much rather see the process maps than the old school narratives. Um, if you can supplement those narratives with the process maps, it's much easier uh, to walk the auditors through those. So it's going to help that as well. And then it also helps when you're developing um, customizations and anything else to really understand um, it, where those customizations are going to fit and it also helps with the training. So that scoping is really important in terms of saying maybe you only focus. You don't have to take on every single business process right away. If order to cash is the highest risk area for you, then make a case for it and focus on that um, before you add procure to pay or month end close or whatever it may be. So um, that's partially another place where we see uh, companies struggle is they take on too much right away, um, and they try to do everything at once. And partially what we like to see is pick that one process and perfect your science around it, right? It allows you to kind of have a pilot program around the reviews and really start to understand everything that goes on with that if you haven't approached the project before. Uh, so go ahead, Kevin, there to the next slide, please. Uh, the next one after the, the uh, technical. Okay, so the technical definition is, Another thing that you need to do is pick a methodology. So there are several different ways that you can do segregation of duties analysis. Uh, you can do it at a transactional level and look at all the times when a user has created a vendor and created a purchase order uh, and, and take all those rules and you're doing transaction sampling to look at that. You can build preventative controls inside of the software. If you were the person that created this vendor, then you cannot create any transactions for this user, right? We've seen people do that um, where it's a high risk is it flat out will not let you. So that's an example of a preventative. The transaction sampling is, is a matter of detective. Preventative means you're not going to let, you know, something happen. The detective is we're going to find out out of it after that has left the building, which can be problematic for high risk areas. If it's cash, it's gone, right? Um, you can also do it at the user access level. Does this user have the ability, right, from, a, from an application security perspective to create a vendor and create uh, a purchase order where you can test that user access? So once you pick that methodology, then you can start uh, to really go forward. Um, so you can also take your business process maps and start to determine the functionality that's required in the target system in Dynamics to, uh, to be able to perform those high-risk processes. So if one of your business processes is maintain a vendor, you can start to go through and understand these are the exact permissions inside of AX or NAV, whatever it may be, that are required to perform that function, right? So if you're doing it based on user access, you start to understand maintaining a vendor involves this access. And then what you do is you build all those access groups together um, and you start to map your SOD policies, like the, the ISACA policy that we talked about at the beginning, and you map those policies down to each individual ERP or each system's access, right? So for AX, you'd have to map that down. You take the ISACA rule set, you start mapping that down to the access required uh, inside of the Dynamics product that you're using. Um, and then once you started, to, you started to build those risks out and that rule set out, uh, you can start to rank those risks. Um, so that risk ranking, like Kevin said, you can use the quantification method to do that. Um, you just work as a team to rank those risks, and then that's going to become your focus, right? Take the risk-based approach as the highest risk. Those are the ones that you want to focus on first. So that organization that we talked about that only had 11 risks in their rule set, they picked those out and they said, you know, these are critical, high risk, whatever terminology you want to use. And there could be other things that you determine as a team that are, yeah, we recognize that for most companies these are risks, but these are so low or acceptable to us that, or because of our team size, you can identify that as well and document the justification behind that. So in that technical definition phase, what you're coming up with is the technical rule set that you're going to use and that methodology that you're going to use going forward, right? So you're going to fall back on that again and again 
um, as you go through. You might also, as Kevin mentioned about uh, there in the second case study, is that if you add customizations or if you add a third-party product uh, to Dynamics, you might want to bring that rule set out and say, and build, bring your uh, business processes out and say, how does this new functionality, how does this new customization impact our rule set? Um, maybe it, mit it mitigates a, a risk, or maybe there's new risk um, because you've done something that nobody else in the world is ever going to do, and that functionality creates a risk at your organization. So again, that technical definition is really building the rule set, having the methodology uh, to go forward. Um, so next slide there, Kevin. Thank you, sir. Uh, is the testing. So first off is uh, determine the scope of your testing. Decide, are we going to just focus on one business process? We're just going to focus on procure to pay uh, this cycle? We're just going to uh, focus on order to cash? Or maybe we're focused on our whole rule set because we're implementing dynamics and we want to make sure that we get security uh, as well-defined and risk-free as possible, right, and, and limit the risks in that security. Um, so when you determine the scope of the testing, it can come down to what business processes are you focused on, what SOD rules are you focusing on, which systems are you focusing on, right? So, you know, a lot, uh, 10 years ago, everybody just had one system, right, SAP, Oracle, Dynamics, that was it. Well, now that we're getting into cloud, uh, more cloud products, we're back to the best of breed. So people might have a CRM product. Uh, they have Dynamics CRM. They have Dynamics NAV. They might have Coupa or Zora or Workday. And they have all these systems that come together. And you need to understand which of these systems are in scope. Um, is your access database with all of your credit cards information, is that in scope or not? So understand the systems that are in scope as well. And then maybe you're only focusing on a certain number of users, right? As you build security, maybe you want to only focus on super users as you're iterating through that security design uh, phase. So first is determine that scope of testing. Uh, one of the things our customers sometimes will say, hey, we just installed uh, the application, we ran our test, and it came back and we had 90,000 conflicts. And it, it, we want to narrow that down again until you really define your process as an organization and say, let's just focus on the high-risk areas or focus on a certain process to really start to kind of consume and understand uh, and also look at the rule set to make sure that that makes sense for what you're trying to do. Um, your risk rank from your, your scoping phase is going to help uh, tremendously as well. And again, when you do the testing, this shouldn't just sit on the security admin's desk. It shouldn't just sit in the audit desk or the business process owner's desk. Everybody should be involved in that testing. So a lot of what we do with our customers is the controller might review the risks for everyone in her department, right? And then she might do that analysis, then provide that analysis back to the audit team to say, hey, this is what I think here on the testing. Or if there's something that she says, you know what, Homer Simpson shouldn't have access to close a fiscal period, let's revoke that security. She can go back to the security team and say, hey, I think we need to make a change here. Now, you don't just have a button that says fix security. You have to work through and say maybe Homer's in the wrong role, maybe his role's ill-defined, maybe we need to fix that security some other way. But you're, again, involving the entire team in that, and then – you would also have the purchasing manager doing the same thing for his department, right, and doing that review. So you're, you're kind of distributing that workload, and you're also getting the people that understand the security, the business, or they understand the business process the best and the security requirements the most involved uh, within that process. So now you found all these risks, right? Okay, now what do we do? So, Kevin, if you go to the next slide. See, you're at, look at this. Like old times, right, Kevin? Um, so, Remediation, and this is, you'll see again, some people say you mitigate first and then you remediate after that. I always say let's clean things up before we go out and start documenting mitigations. And so what I mean by cleaning up security is many of the issues can be fixed. A lot of times we'll see people run an SOD report, a conflict report, and they're seeing users, and this is a different risk, but they see users that are in that report that haven't worked at the company in three years. They just haven't been disabled or deleted from Dynamics, 
well, those are real easy to fix. Why do I want to go out and mitigate something that's no longer, I mean, it's a big risk that you have people that are no longer the company with access. Let's just go get rid of those users. Or you start to clean up that security uh, at the roles. So focus on the roles first. Start to iterate through those roles and say, really take a hard look and run the testing at the role level. Does the AP clerk really need to have access to create a purchase order? Yes, they do. Okay. Could they just have view level access to vendors? Yes, we can do that. And now you're starting to refine your security. Um, using the pr principle of least privilege is huge in this case, where it's a lot of times what we'll see is um, when you go to implement a product, implement dynamics, um, Security implementation during the impl during the implement initial implementation is typically a low priority. Um, I know Kevin and I have worked on projects together where they said, okay, we'll just make everybody admin when we go live, and then we'll fix it later. And usually later shows up when the auditors show up, and that's not a fun place to be. So you have this over-granting of security. Um, you also have people where security just over time degrades where people get access to something because somebody went on maternity leave or they were doing some a special project and it never, that security never gets revoked. So if you can go back to that, uh, that principle of least privilege, only give the user exactly what they need um, and remember to use the read-only privilege or view depending on the Dynamics product you're on, make sure that you're making full use of that inquiry because a lot of times we'll see people just say, Yep, you can have full control or uh, full access to that when they really don't change that information. Um, so your goal in the end is that the roles support what a user needs to do on a daily basis, right? Your goal should, when you're designing security and, and implementing roles, your role should support what that user has to do, not support your SOD methodology, right? Because you're gonna get people that come down and say, now I can't do anything as a security administrator. You're gonna have a line at your door of people complaining they can't do anything, and that's not good. Um, we get people that ask us all the time, would you build a set of conflict-free roles that we could use inside of Dynamics? And, and it's just not realistic. It's anybody that tells you that that's an option, it, it's not. Um, and that goes across every single ERP that we work with. Um, people ask that, and it's just not something that works from a productivity standpoint. Um, so you can get, you can build templates uh, that are very close to conflict-free, but really what you want to do is test the roles to make, to limit the number of inherent conflicts in the role. But a lot of times the mistake we see out of security administrators is they take it as a binary project. It's either all right or all wrong. If I have one conflict, then the whole thing is broken, and then they end up having it too restrictive of a security model, and that's not realistic either. So once you get all the security cleaned up, then what you can do is say, okay, what's left are things that are risks. That's, in the end, what's there. So if we go to the next slide there, Kevin, that's mitigation. And this is shoring up your application security with controls, right, application security and dynamics is the number one control feature there. But there are all sorts of other controls you can implement inside of dynamics, right? You have workflow, um, and then there are things outside of dynamics that you might be doing um, that are manual controls, right? So the best security model is one that blends application security with the controls to allow users to have productivity but then it also minimizes the risk or mitigates that risk. So when you're mitigating, it's, that risk is never going to go away. Hey, look, we only have two AP clerks in our whole organization. If we were strict, you know, we'd have to hire three other people to just create vendors. That doesn't make any sense. So we're going to leave that there as an organization, but we're going to put uh, something in place so there's a workflow approval or sign-offs or whatever it may be. Um, so again, the mitigation may be outside, right? How many people use positive pay with their bank? That control sits at the bank. Um, so the inside of Dynamics wouldn't know that. So what you want to do is once you've identified that the risk is there and it's going to stay there, you want to document that mitigation with that risk, right? And then the mitigation needs to be appropriate to the risk level. So what I mean by that is that, okay, well, we don't want Kevin creating a uh, creating Microsoft as a vendor and then ordering a million Xboxes and having them show up on our dock. Um, that would be bad. We want to make sure that we have an approval process that says Kevin has a purchasing authority of this. 
we have to have an approval from these three people to go over that, um, and nothing ever gets released from the system until uh, that's done. Um, there can be other things like journal entries where you say, you know what, we do a monthly journal entry reconciliation because those are things that we can catch and fix later down the line, um, so it's not as high risk. So there could be something that's more of a preventative control outside of the application security. Um, you could have something that was more of a detective control that's you're reviewing audit trail data, right? Things of that nature, doing transaction sampling, but you need to make sure the mitigation is appropriate uh, to the risk level, and that's where you can get your internal audit team involved as you go through that. The business process owners review the user risk, they say this is the control we have in place, and then the audit team can help test that to make sure that that, miss, that uh, mitigation is appropriate for the risk. Um, we've had a couple customers that'll just say, yep, everything is minimal risk. Well, it's, it's, it's probably not, right? Well, I did my documentation, I'm done. Everything has a mitigation. Well, that's not appropriate, right? So, um, and that is a real case study where we had people doing that and they were wondering why they were getting in trouble. Um, and, and then the mitigations must be tested. If you're going to use workflow from, uh, if you're gonna be using workflow you want to make sure that that workflow is actually on, right? So if, you, if you're going to say to the auditors, yep, we use workflow for that, and somebody accidentally disables the workflow, or the per, you always have the same people approving each other's work, right? I'm always approving Kevin's order of Cubs World Series tickets. Hopefully I didn't jinx that, uh, right? You don't, want to, you, you don't want to have the same people uh, approving that, and you want to make sure that that control is effective and in place. Um, so we see that a lot as well, where people will say, this is my control, but then they never go back to look to see if that control is in place, if it's effective. So you need to make sure that you're going to test those mitigations as well. Um, so those are really kind of the key areas to go to. Do the scoping, do the technical side, build your rule sets, um, and then you want to do the, the, the testing once you have those rule sets, and then you go through those last two phases of the cleanup and shore up. Um, and that's, if you can get that far, you're ahead of a lot of the customers uh, that we work with, um, and, and it's gonna help you be successful, because again, this is something that's ongoing. It's an ongoing process. It's not just a one-time transaction for most people. Uh, so Kevin, I'll throw it back to you for our uh, kind of conclusion and the QA if anybody has any questions. Thanks, Andy. So uh, appreciate the, the guidance and the insight. I know we're uh, running up on our time uh, so I just want to go through a few things real quick. You know, the first this slide you're going to see is our SOD risk management maturity model. So um, where are you? You know, a lot of organizations that we see as um, the increasing demand from the PCOB is, is driving the need to increase, increase their maturity, they're gradually moving up this scale. Um, you'll see as you move up, you increase your risk reduction. And um, the, the bottom line is the amount of time to actually begin implementing uh, this level of effort. So as you move to the right, you know, it takes a little bit more time to actually implement all the activities to get you uh, to the top level. And so not every organization wants to be best in class in controls. Uh, I think the key here is understanding where do you need to be from a compliance perspective and where do you want to be from an organizational perspective and, and what's your risk tolerance. So finally, uh, just to wrap everything up, you know, some of the key takeaways here, just be smart, right? There's going to be uh, an increased scrutiny, so be proactive. Uh, make sure you're getting ahead of these questions from your auditors. Uh, make sure that, that you're reacting to the findings as, as um, appropriately addressing the, the issues that people are identifying. Um, identify mitigation strategies and make sure that they're effective. Um, it used to be that showing that you plan to remediate or mitigate an SOD violation was sufficient. Now you have to prove that it's sufficient. So make sure that your mitigations are actually able to truly catch the abuse. Um, access should be built upon least privilege principle. As Andy said, you know, this is where you need to start. Make sure your access is built on that least privileged principle and that you're limiting the capabilities of the individuals. Um, you know, because having a tool just isn't enough to, to support uh, your 
your assertion that controls are operating effectively. Um, real risk should drive your remediation priorities. Make sure that um, you're evaluating that risk to determine what needs to be done from a remediation perspective. Um, you know, it's possible to overdo your remediation strategy, so make sure that, you know, you're focusing on the key risks. Um, and finally, uh, technology is the key to sustainability. So making sure that you have technology to support your assessment, to support your processes, and to ensure that it's built into your process to evaluate uh, segregation duties and security. Um, I know we're running up on our time, uh, but you know, Jason, any questions? Uh, so some people have asked about access to the slide deck. Is there uh, any guidance you can give us on that? Yeah, yeah Kevin will be that. selling us. Yeah, Kevin will sell <laughs> uh, signed copies after the session if anybody wants one. <laughs> yeah, what, what, five dollars a slide, and then you know fifty for the whole thing. So, yeah, we'll make the slide available to all the attendees. <laughs> I do want to make a, a last call for questions here. If anyone else to have any, uh, this is the time to to ask them. And um, uh, one that came in was um, whether migration from on-premise to cloud ERP complicates risk assessment. Uh, Sorry, could you repeat that? It was I, I, Jason. The question was if if transitioning from on-prem uh, to the cloud. Uh, presents challenges from an SOD assessment perspective. Is that fair? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it really does. I mean, the the, the, uh, the the challenge is the same whether you're on-prem or in the cloud um, from, from that perspective. Um, you know, we have <laughs> – we haven't really seen a whole lot of difference in terms of uh, we're capable of analyzing the cloud ERPs just as much as any of the on-prem ERPs. It's it's uh, mostly the same data. It's just how you get it. Uh, Kevin, you have any thoughts there? No, I think you, you summed it up. The only other challenge that I'm seeing other than, you know, some of the things that, that you guys are going in cloud is finding the technology to support some of the analysis, you know, depending on what application you're on. Um, you know, making sure that you have sufficient technology to support that. And I know you guys are, are working hard in, in that area. Yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't Kevin, want to do massive. Your contact. Sorry, go ahead, Jason. I was just going to say, uh, if you want to put up your contact, I see some people are starting to leave. If you want to put up your contact information, that way people can follow up. But sorry, Andy, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, we we support all the all the cloud uh, ERPs that are currently available, um, and we have our our tool is now in the cloud as well. We have a SaaS offering, um, and we're transitioning the Dynamics clients that are moving to the cloud over to that. Um, you know, for the most part, we've it's been a extremely successful transition. Um, but again, a lot of it is you know the biggest challenge we see is availability of the data in some of the um, providers, so other, not not on the dynamic side so much, um, but if there's other tools that you have that are cloud uh, in, in scope for the cloud, sometimes it can be a challenge uh, to extract the data from that and do any sort of combined analysis, right? If you use Coupa and you're trying to do an analysis with Coupa and AX, it can be a challenge, but specifically just um, for one product, for a Dynamics product, uh, we haven't seen a whole lot of challenges there yet, but I'm sure we will. Uh, we, we have a final question here. Um, I want to remind folks that uh, also we do have a survey that will pop up as you depart today, and we really appreciate it. And if, you, if you can take 15 or 20 seconds just to provide feedback for us and for our presenters um, after the session. But the last question here is, uh, we're currently focused on uh, AX 2012 SOD. Uh, what's your take on using standard roles? Hey, Jason, this is Kevin. Um, the, from my perspective, and, and we've done a number of assessments around AX 2012, you're going to find that a lot of those standards roles have conflicts. Um, it's just kind of based on you know, the feedback that Microsoft was given around what their user uh, requirements were and the usability. But 
from my perspective, I've seen a lot of conflicts in justice standard roles. Andy? Yeah, I mean, I, I would always say that those standard roles are a, are a template. I wouldn't just blindly use them out of the box. Um, so I know, you know, from our methodology, there are a lot of conflicts. Um, and Microsoft, we're working with Microsoft to start to clean up some of those uh, standard roles. But, yeah, I'd be careful using those. The other thing is, is I haven't really found a whole lot of organizations that have been able to use them out of the box based on the requirements for their end users. So I have always considered actually any ERP, not just AX2012, that whatever comes native out of the system is a template and a launch point, not something you should just say, if that's how Microsoft defined AP clerk, they probably got it spot on for our organization. I'd look at it as a template. Yeah, that's a good point, right? It's it's something to help give you a starting point and a guide, but it, it's not going to, typically it's not going to be perfect for your organization. Okay, well, we will end it with that question. Thank you very much for the question, and, uh, and guys, thanks for uh, taking the extra time there. Uh, we're going to end at this point. We did record today's event. We'll be making that available. Uh, Kevin, Andy, thank you so much for the time today. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason. And, uh, yeah, and this was uh, part of a uh, multi-webcast series on, uh, on GRC. So uh, please be on the lookout for uh, future sessions coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, we hope to see you back here. Uh, with that, we're going to say uh, thanks and have a great day.